So I am so excited today to have one Bob Phipps joining me today on Retail Redeveloped. Now, Bob Phipps has a very interesting handle, moniker, title uh, that, that I think everybody listening to this will, will enjoy. Um, he is the retail doctor. Um, he has been in the business for a long, long time. Bob, thank you so much for joining me today. Appreciate it, Adam. Uh, so, Bob, would you do me a favor and explain to the listeners how you got this this title, the retail doctor, and just how you came to sit in uh, in the seat that you're sitting in now? <laughs> well, how about we just start uh, sooner than later? That uh, you know, I am the brand. Uh, of choice for an awful lot of people from Lego to Yamaha, from um, luxury brands to independent boutiques and everything in between for essentially how do we craft an exceptional customer experience? That's my background. I'm all about selling the merch in a brick and mortar store. Yes, we can use technology, but it's no excuse for um, becoming colder in an increasingly more technological world. We are looking as human beings right now, we're looking for more human connections in a world that's continually telling us it's about being always on and connected through technology. So it is my 25th year as a retail doctor. I I got my degree in college as a conductor and uh, I decided that I wasn't going to be able to do much with that. So I went on and uh, my part-time job where I was selling cowboy clothes became a full-time uh, job and uh, ended up growing a little retailer from, uh, I think, four retail locations to the largest in the United States before one day the owner asked, what's a, custom, what's a, what's a company's greatest asset? And I said, well, it's easy. It's employees. And he said, wrong. And people went around the room. They couldn't figure it out. And he says, it's customers. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I went down to his office and I said, uh, customers are fickle. They'll go anywhere. The only way we're going to be successful is our employees, just like it has been the last several years been developing this. Uh, I can't work like this. I'm out in two weeks. So I was a bit of a shock and I quit and I went to a Tony Robbins seminar not that long ago. And he said, you better come up with a brand nobody else can duplicate. And I literally filed the trademark the next morning for the retail doctor. And I had a bit of a, a challenge understanding what that would look like and do. And I was a consultant for a couple of years. And then I basically took one little guy who a coffee roaster in Long Beach, California, who was going up against. I took one coffee retailer who was going up against uh, a, two, a second Starbucks, 100 feet from his front look front location and increased his sales 50% the first year and 40% the next. And uh, then reached out to local media with the interest in the story. They were called the New York times and said, would you mention how the little guy beats the big guy? And they're like, sure we would. And they interviewed me and ran, I was speaking in uh, New York city on October 30th, 1997. And there on the front page was my picture of the story that was going to be on the inside of the business section. And I opened the business section. That's the entire upper half meet the category killer killer and that pretty much launched uh, my uh, first book and more speeches and then making uh, makeovers for the los angeles times and uh, and other organizations as well because it still comes down to i'm product agnostic i don't care what you sell if you don't create a branded experience you're going to pretty much just be a warehouse carrying 90 percent of the same merchandise that your competitors do and the only thing you can control is your four walls. And that has been my true North for the last 25 years as the retail doctor. So that's, there's, there's a lot that, that I would like to <laughs> unpack from that, from that first uh, two minutes, but could you go into how someone like you, who is like me, very kind of niche oriented, how can you be product agnostic when you know, some people are trying to sell mattresses. Some people are trying to sell, you know, dental hygiene. Like, like yeah. how can, how, what are those principles that you were able to find early on that you knew were, were so important that they could kind of cross boundaries? Well, it's funny you say that because I got the highest increase at South Coast Plaza, the number one mall in the world. And the owners came down and they're like, what the hell are you doing down here selling cowboy clothes? And they said, it doesn't matter what I'm selling. I said, go into Tiffany's, go into some of these other large brands and you feel nothing. And all they think that they're selling is a silly ring or a bracelet or a sweater and, and that's it. And it's like, no, 
brick and mortar exists to answer one question from a consumer, what's new, and then ultimately make them feel something more. Because people who feel they matter buy more. So that's simple. We learned that certainly from Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. It's basic sales training from an awful long time ago. But it doesn't matter. The, the, the place retailers get in trouble is you think your product matters and it doesn't. So you've got the cheapest crap mattress for one ninety nine, and you're going to be able to, you know, promote this and then be able to get people to come in, maybe get them up to 299. I had a guy, Barry uh, Brown on my uh, podcast uh, two months ago with sleep store in San Jose, California. He sells $50,000 mattresses. Five, now he's 50, managed a, five, zero thousand, five, zero comes from me. There's three of them. They're environmentally conscious. They come from Sweden. There's a lot of things about it. And admittedly he is up in Silicon Valley. However, he also was an exec for a lot of chains that had multiple uh, mattress stores. And he said the best get it, that it's not about that mattress or that price. And that's the same thing to your listeners that, um, you know, make no mistake, location is incredibly important in retail. If you want to talk about that with me, I've got some ideas, I'm sure, as well. But um, ultimately, you're not known for the product. You're known for your ability to engage a stranger, discover the shopper, and make a customer. This idea that it doesn't matter if they buy from you today is total BS. That if somebody comes in your store, oh, if they buy on the web or they buy wherever, we're just happy they came in. That's garbage because if they don't convert to a sale, you're just a hobby. You know, Warby Parker, name all the digital man brands that have come into retail right now. They know their KPIs. They know their conversion rates. And they know that those stores are delivering higher than an online store can because they're training people, they're hiring selectively, and they're having a branded experience. And so if you're listening to this, I don't care if you're selling widgets or you're selling uh, clothes or whatever it is, if there's not a branded shopping experience when a shopper comes to you, you're in danger of being eaten by the online bandits. So would you walk me through that branded experience? Uh, because again, I'm, I'm right now in my head, I'm, I'm thinking about a, you know, a fine tailor or garment okay. maker or clothier, or I'm okay. thinking about a Warby Parker or I'm th- I mean, you could go in so many different areas. What is it about that brand experience that transcends the product? Like you keep mentioning uh, that, that you think, you can carry across multiple product lines. Like what is it about well, that I, engagement? What is it about that brand? Is there, are there one well, or two couple, things that stand out? There's a couple of things is one. You just got to be curious about why today did they walk in my store? Why did they, this woman walk into my apparel? Why, why did this guy, let's just take it that go to your, uh, your tailor. Why did this guy walk into my store today? Chances aren't good that he's, it's doubtful. He's walking into a tailor for a sad time. Like, Hey, I'm going to a funeral. I want a custom suit doesn't happen right so he probably has a promotion or he's got a girl or a guy he wants to impress or he lost 50 pounds or his son wants him to go to a dad and son dinner or there's a million stories out there but you think it's about your silly suit that's on sale for 2.99 this weekend only so he walks in and you greet him can i help you and he says um yeah i'm just looking around well let me know if you need anything Guy looks around. Is it 40 size 40 suits over here? Yeah, we have some more over here. Great. Okay. So maybe he tries one on. It's like, this one's on sale. Do you have a budget for how much you want to spend for the suit? Yeah, I don't know. You know, a couple hundred bucks. Oh, well, this one is uh, like 400. I can show you one that's 199. And they get into all this garbage instead of. Um, so what's, 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 uh, what's the event you're shopping for today? Oh, I'm not shopping for an event. I just made some good, uh, new, a new suit for my office. Oh, that's great. You know, I get to wear a suit every day. So what do you, uh, what's your business? Oh, I'm a, I'm a banker and, uh, all my clothes got lost in a fire. Well, great. Well, I tell you what, uh, it looks like you're, I can see from your shoes, you've got nice shoes. Those are, uh, what are those? Are they Alan Edmonds? They are Alan Edmonds. Well, great. Well, why don't you slip on this jacket? Take a look in the mirror. How does that make you feel? I feel really confident. Awesome. Well, that's, and here's, and now we're off, but they're two totally different approaches. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one, you feel like, dude, I, I'll go anywhere with you. <laughs> it's like, whatever so, you want, I'm with you versus so, the other one. You're like, this is, this is like, I'd go to a, 
an outlet store or something and you don't feel anything like that. It's, it's just really um, off-putting and people don't even see it. Retailers don't even see it. They think they're being efficient when they're really just cutting the very thing that makes them unique in a shopping world. So would you say that you're more concerned about a retailer's steps of service and connection with the customer on a peer-to-peer level more so than did they spend an extra ten grand on their lighting package and on their absolutely because you'll get that's, the, that's you'll where get your the, heart is. You'll get the ten grand. You'll open your heart to me. It's like my. It's funny. My mom is like ninety four, and uh, she got a new doctor. And I said, "So did you tell him everything that's wrong?" She goes, "I did not. I don't didn't know him well enough." Well, that's kind of it. You know, if you're not if you're not building trust. Customer's not going to say, you know, I've got a black American Express Centurion card. I could pretty much buy a house on this. The sky's the limit. They don't do that. Right. They're looking for steps of trust that you give them. And so if you're selling a, you know, if you're selling something in the home, you're selling window coverings or flooring, they're very expensive purchases. And there's a lot of mistrust about, I'm going to have to live with this a long time if it's wrong. So when you're in the home, you just say, would you give me a brief tour of it? You don't just start with, let me measure and let me, you know, what color is the, just try to be human. And the good news is that, um, you know, with my retail sales training, I've proven that it's not hard, but you've got to be convinced this is your way forward. Because if you're still stuck and it's all about price and selection, I'm here to tell you you're in trouble because a lot of manufacturers right now are leaping over their independent dealer networks because they know, they know the experience is so bad and they're either opening their own stores or they're going through and they're going direct to consumer online. So uh, the stakes are pretty high for bad service. And frankly, that's all you've got. You know, even if you have a pretty store, at the end of the day, it's just a pretty store. Unless somebody is going to convert to an actual sale, I think you're at risk. So let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, again, I keep coming back to the steps of service, uh, which great restaurants are, are known for. Uh-huh. You know, you, you greet them within X amount of time. You never have a, you know, a iced tea glass that's half empty. You know, th- th- these types of things. In today's world, and I'm talking literally today, July 2019, uh, where the unemployment rate is so low that your typical retail store worker. I'm not talking about the owner. I'm not talking about the C-suite. Yep. I'm not talking about the guy with the black card. Uh, yep. I'm talking about the, how do you get those steps of service on a scalable kind of basis? Like I get, you've got one coffee shop, you've got the owner sitting there coming in and clocking in and clocking out and watching, watching the gate. Right. But, but how do you, how do you scale this principle of, of humanity and connection? Like, is that, I, I could only well, assume that's a huge challenge. Well, but it's always been a huge challenge. So shut the hell up and do the job. You know, it's like, it's always hard to get good people. Yeah, right. it is. It always has been. But going back to your point with the restaurant, how many restaurants actually train that anymore? I'll guarantee you they don't because it's hard because I don't, I, I, you know, you put people in positions of power that don't like to, I don't really want to, I don't really want to be, I'm correcting him. I don't really, I want to be their friend. So I'll motivate him. We'll go out to lunch. We'll be buddies. It's like, you can't be, it's a boss. It's called a boss and a worker. But to your point, you know, I have probably 10,000 people training on my online retail sales training program, which is basically virtual Bob in a box across. I don't know. I think we're in 25 countries right now. People have never met me. People have met me. And so it does scale, but I'll tell you, it only works with the owners that say, this is going to be my unique selling proposition that the days of me of just loading up more lines in my store or restaurants just coming up more specials unless we do more we're going to be in trouble and uh, since you said what today's date is my friend um, i don't know if you saw the recent uh article i think it it might have been the la times but how um, the golden age of restaurants is over that uh there's a school of thought that says um, a lot of chefs are just going to be opening in business parks and then using um, delivery services to get it because so many people do takeout. And I don't ascribe to that. I think there's always going to be a mark for some of that, but I don't believe that restaurants are gone. But I will say that the restaurants who 
have horrible or moderate or mediocre experiences are going to be put under pressure because there's nothing special there and they typically have kind of a narrow, you know, gee, we have Italian. Well, so does everybody else or something that's easily duplicated in a lot of ways. But what isn't is that feeling when I dine there. And it doesn't have to be the Margianos, but they do a great job. Uh, Macarena Grill does a great job. They close, you know, they open a new store, a new restaurant, and I think they, they're dark for a week and then they're open for a week, but only um, for, for people who come in. They don't charge them. I mean, that's amazing. I went into, um, oh, at LA Live this year in January, and I forget who it is. Is it Shaq? I think it's Shaq opened this new restaurant. It was the worst service I'd ever been, and it was packed. Like, drinks are going back wrong. A buddy of mine orders a black Russian, it comes back white. I'm like, uh, a white Russian is white. A black Russian doesn't have cream. Oh, sorry, the food was burned and i was just like this is horrible but everybody was coming because of shaq's name on it well you know if my name was on it i certainly would have opened a restaurant like that and then just thrown the crew and said good luck i certainly would have said i'm gonna invest it so when people say oh, does it scale well all that does scale is humans you know a branded experience is a goes to b goes to c goes to d to, goes to e what doesn't scale is do whatever you want and just you know, get the food out on time because ultimately there's errors, there's wasted time, drinks are not refilled. And in seconds you are judged and people don't come back. Yeah. I think the best so, example of that, and I'm going to talk in a kind of a regional way right now, uh, because there's a, there's a brand down here called Chick-fil-A, um, who's very big in the South, Southeast yep. and it's expanding nationally now, but I never know what markets uh, they're in and what they're, where they're not. But you can have a Chick-fil-A on one corner and a fill-in-the-blank McDonald's, Burger King, whatever it is, on the right next door, opposite corner, right next door, same labor pool, you know, same price point, all that. It's a 180-degree different situation when you walk well, in. But that's the experience a whole... is 100% different. And, uh, and a lot but of it, yeah, the food might be a little a better. Different... Well, but they're a different item altogether because the only way you can get one of those is you've got to pretty much convince one of the existing operators to like you. You have mm -hmm. to go willing to work for that guy to basically have him pitch you to the corporate office to put you through their management training. And then you pretty much got to agree with their worldview, which, let's be honest, I'm in a blue state and Chick-fil-A is not known as a, a diverse employer or a diverse um you know, social uh, uh, media, social, I can't think of what it is, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's got a, it's got a reputation in some circles yeah, and yet, right. but what they've done is they have been very clear on keeping a very tight thread on who gets to actually run the store. And then because they've done so much of vetting of those people, then they're going to vet only the best people. And so, you know, kudos to them because they know exactly who they want and they know that they're going to be passionate because they had to do so many steps to get there. I think too many retailers, too many businesses open with this build it and they will come. And there's no real there, there. There's not a great chef that's going to come out and be part of it all, or there's not a great customer service to, to lead with it, or the retail offering is pretty boring. And so you're just hoping someone will put up with bad service. And to your point, Chick-fil-A has raving fans, always has. You know, it's that's the other thing. They've been in business, what, 30 years? Oh, yeah, at least. That's hard to do. Yeah, that's least. hard to do. It is very hard to do. And, and their average unit volume is staggering compared to everybody else in their in their class. It's 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 amazing. Whether, whether you, you – love or hate their views, their worldview, like you said. I mean, the, the way that they've been able to develop their concept is, is incredible. Um, well, and you'd think McDonald's used to have that. That's what's kind of funny. You know, McDonald's was like that. But when you're, you know, you're charging people a million bucks to get a franchise, it doesn't seem like you have to be as passionate about it as as Chick-fil-A does. And certainly there are other operators. I guess Biscuit Bill down by you is well known, right? Oh, you, you were just in Greensboro. <laughs> now, now, I can, now I can really tell. 
So we, Bojangles is the is the Charlotte local Charlotte version. But I went to school okay. in uh, very near Greensboro uh, in Burlington, which is uh-huh. Biscuitville epicenter. So yeah, I I, I had a few pounds uh, freshman sophomore year to thank uh, Biscuitville. For. Yeah, I'll bet, I'll bet. But but we know it when we see it. See, that's what's different. We know it. You feel it. Um, it's it's not a one off, and that's where so many retailers when. When people are raving about you, it's not by accident. You right. already knew that. You know, I have one of my, yeah, one of my sales or ex guys. He's got uh, several electronic stores, and uh, and he, and when I was, we were coming together on the agreement. He said, "Well, they need to deliver an, a wow experience." You know, that's that's how I'm going to know it. And I said, "Well, how do you know if they deliver a wow experience?" He goes, "I'm going to be outside one of my stores on a Saturday afternoon, and if I don't hear at least one." wow, that was amazing. In an hour, I'm going to have words with the manager. I was like, dude, that's amazing. But he's passionate because he knows that's why he's going to be successful. I guess that's where I keep coming back to. You know, one of the things I was just hearing uh, when I was down there was Henriden, which is one of the biggest furniture manufacturers, went out of business recently. Just a spectacular fall. And it's well known. And it's a great, it was a great brand. But somehow there was a disconnect between them and the dealers. Somehow that this loved brand was allowed to not be treated the same way when customers got it. So if you're a manufacturer listening to this as well, you know, the part, people you have as partners representing your brand are just as important. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. So your, your tagline is tell me something good about retail, <laughs> uh, which, which, which I like. Uh, what is something good you can tell us about retail today? Because obviously we're, we're hit with a lot of, you know, apocalyptic imagery, uh, which I understand. I mean, uh, store closures um, are, are, are a topic, and they, and they get clicks. Uh, but tell me something good about retail, in, unless you think the, the, the store is on fire, last one out, turn out the lights. That's all such – yeah, you're, it's all clickbait, my friend. I mean, Feel look, free to curse. Retail. It felt like you wanted to curse there. Feel free to curse if you <laughs> like. Bad, bad retail is on fire, my friend. <clears throat> When's the last time you went into a Sears – a Kmart, uh, a charming Charlie, I guess, just went lost 200 stores. Um, you know, the Radio Shack. I mean, the ones that are going out, there's a reason they're going out because it's it's not good. Uh, you know, I say that um, we can change the world by the people working in shopping and retail. I absolutely believe retail is a normalizer of people. I, I think every parent listening to this should have your kid actually have to work in retail where you learn that oh i have to like this person before they like me and there are standards and if they're not met i'm let go and the world doesn't owe me anything and you learn all of that when you're working in retail but um quite simply retail what people don't miss about retail is whether it's small or mid-size or even uh in some of the larger operations it forms that spider uh, thread between people that makes community. We know ourselves by how we buy things, where we buy things, how we eat, where we eat. It's those shared experiences what makes community. You know, we are now caught up in this uh, endless polarization and you're this and you're that. And it's easy to say that when they don't have faces. And so the more we go online and the less we actually do go into a store or go through traffic or go to the shopping mall or the skyscraper interface with other people, the more we're going to get caught in this cocoon and start believing that that is reality when it really isn't. You know, we just did a survey with Oracle NetSuite and we found that lo and behold, 57% of millennials actually want to go out into brick and mortar stores. So it, all of these ideas of what people are and aren't, um, just belays the fact that we are social creatures and we're being sold a bill of goods that you only want to shop on a phone and you want to make sure that your uh, orders are free both ways and that it doesn't matter. But purchases bought online don't have the same feeling as something you found and discovered in a store. And so, you know, I say online is about buying. I need an HP model 45 color cartridge i'm probably gonna go to amazon and i'm done i don't really want to need to go to office depot to try to see if they have it Um, but if i was in a store and uh, i happened to be going in if i needed that and i happened to see i don't know maybe a piece of furniture for my office or something then someone's got to be there to help me see that and someone's got to be there 
to get me over that I can wait. And all of that is the, is the uh, power of retail. And just very quickly, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but isn't it interesting when we're hearing how many stores are dying and the retail apocalypse and all this, and yet Lululemon opens a 20,000 square foot location in Chicago in the last week. Or RH, Restoration Hardware, which everybody discounted. Oh, they're just going to be eaten by online and they're going to die. And they've opened these RH galleries, which are multi-store historic buildings that are growing sales by leaps and bounds because it's a physical space to explore. So when I see that, it doesn't quite jive with the narrative that all of retail is dying. And the last point I would give you is the Wall Street Journal recently did an article and showed that if you segment online shopping, 40% is audio and video and books. So if you bought something on iTunes or you download a movie on, uh, you know, whether it's Amazon Prime or something else, that's considered online shopping. So it's really not as dire as everybody wants to make it believe. In fact, some believe we may be stuck at what it's going to be, that it may not grow by 20 and 30 percent because we're seeing those levels declining. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to pay attention to it because smart retailers like Walmart and several others offer any kind of shopping you want online, in store, on a tablet, buy online, pick up in store, deliver to curb, whatever. But they're they're making money. Target especially has been doing a great job of that. Walmart when also conventional yeah. Walmart also, but conventional wisdom is, oh, they can't compete. Well they are competing. So let's, All because, yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit more because obviously buying online, buy online, pick up in store, these are all things that that wasn't at the foremost of our consciousness, you know, certainly ten years ago, much less twenty years ago. Sure. What what trends are what other trends maybe a little less obvious trends are you seeing that are transforming retail today that, that really have your attention? Uh, I think the whole thing around um, instant messaging, chatbots, instant communication, this idea that we're going to still keep doing email seems to be falling away. That it's about, you know, it's kind of like taking this whole idea of Slack and, and texting to a new level that people are expecting real time. Like I'm on your site. They should be able to walk me through uh, scheduling my haircut or uh, my car, or any number of different things easily. I don't have to interface with somebody. It's kind of a, a mindless thing to do. I think also that same idea that if somebody's on your site, you can engage with them. Uh, they're not going to probably download content and look, sign up for your offers or your newsletter. That's probably just not going to happen. But paying attention in real time to who's there, um, that seems to be where we're where we're all moving. And, of course, that's why... AI is becoming such a big idea is how can it help customize that experience so it doesn't feel quite so um, cold and heartless. It makes perfect sense. How, how else do you think retailers, other than AI and, and kind of this, this general notion that, that we're all supposed to be on 24-7, how else do you think these retailers need to morph? Uh, and obviously this is more talking about legacy brands, um, to stay relative in the, in this digital age that that seems to be just moving so quickly. Well, that <laughs> relevance a good question. I mean, you know, uh, you know, one of my favorite subjects is I I love to shop at Nordstrom, but I got to tell you, they keep coming out with every shirt as a trim fit. And I've got to go up an extra step, and they have all these little boutique brands, and yet there's really nobody there that really kind of helps or guides other than just rings things up, I think you're going to have to find to get back to being brilliant on the basics. I think it's the same thing for most retailers that we've, uh, the, the consumer is punishing brick and mortar retailer right now because of decades of poor service and people are working too hard and doing too much to save their money to go in and feel that they aren't valued or to feel like, um, I'm just in here like rats to the cheese. Cause I got a coupon. I think that the smart retailers are realizing They've got a much better play by getting somebody into the store. In fact, we're seeing that with some of the larger uh, companies like a Target and some of the other ones used to. You would just order something on their website and say you could ship it to them. And now it'll say, hey, you know, that's only two miles away at uh, a location. Do you want to just pick it up there right now? And they're realizing if they can get someone to come into the store, 
they can build the sales a lot better than leaving them online. So I think just being smart in figuring out new ways to engage people and then realizing, you know, employees are your most important asset. That's and how are, you gonna, how are you going to go through and leverage that and train them? Because training has to have four components. It's got to be great training. It's got to actually be impactful. they got to practice it, role play, and then be held accountable. If they're not held accountable, I can guarantee you Chick fil A holls all their employees accountable. Oh, Dollars no to question. donuts. No question. That's no question. And there's no question about training. So um, why is it that they can do it? It's like a buddy of mine said uh, when he was working at uh, K's dad's KFC back in the 60s. And uh, I guess one of the brand standards was you had to wear hair nets because guys had such long hair. And uh, this uh, guy is telling his dad, you know, well, I can't get anyone in my store to wear hair nets. And he goes, well, Disney can. Why can't we? Because that Disneyland is there in California. And he's like, well, what do you mean? He goes, they're committed to it. You want to work there? That's what it's going to be. So I have to be an employer of choice, which means I've got to think more about it's a partnership rather than I'm going to use this kid for a minimum wage. And I think that's the next place we're going. That No two ways about it. Minimum wage is going up. Whether it's legislated by the federal level, the state level, or more likely it's going to be done at the um, city level, you're going to have to get more out of these people. Instead of begrudging it, it should say, oh, so my investment has gone up. I guess I should invest in them more so they stay around longer instead of just thinking I can burn through them as long as I got somebody for three months. It's good enough. Yeah, that makes a lot this of sense. That's especially true for your restaurant people listening, right? Because a great server is wonderful. And if they have a second nature to be able to understand that it's about making that guest feel something when they're in there, then they're worth their weight in gold. So why begrudge anything to them? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you see a lot of people trying to figure that out with like, okay, the server's crushing it, but you know, they're only the, the forward link in a chain. How, how do we, how do we kind of raise the, the quality of living for, for the entire back of house along with the front of the house? It's a, it's a yeah. complicated question. There's a lot of smart people trying to figure it out. Um, it is. So let's talk a little bit about content. Uh, you mentioned something about Target and, and Walmart and how they're, you know, battling with, with the online thing and, and trying to stay relevant. What, in your mind, what does successful content look like from, the, from a retailer level? And, and how are you seeing smart retailers reach out and connect with these consumers and, and driving more customers to, the, to their door? What, what do you see, who is impressing you in that, in that arena right now? Well, REI is doing a nice job. They, they've they got like their own, uh, I think there's REI.TV now, but they're, they're doing these innovative ways to kind of get content in front of people and then their products are what's used to get there. I mean, they've, they've had a good, they've had a good, um, uh, you know, they, they're also partners with IBM, I think too. And so their website is all, um, you know, if you were to go online, let's say for this weekend and it was supposed to be raining, the website is automatically changing to show weather gear. And it's changing if it knows that you are uh, like purple, it's just going to end up showing you the, the purple shirt, et cetera. So I think that the smart retailers are looking at how do I not be creepy, but how do I add that level of personalization and that bit of knowing exactly the location someone's in so that I, I, get them to linger longer, certainly when I'm on a web page or on an app. And then I think the smart retailers uh, do the same thing in their stores. They really understand who their guy or gal is instead of just saying, oh, we got this stuff in. It's So now it's what, July? So now we got to get all of our fall merchandise out. They're really thinking about, well, how does this play into our customer journey? And, and again, I go back to a Lululemon with 20,000 square feet. You know, they added a restaurant, they've added uh, all kinds of classes and different things because they know their customers so well. Uh, and that's probably going to be a screaming success. You look at the Starbucks roasteries that, uh, Howard Schultz tried to get going. He's got, a, I think there's four in America right now. And, uh, it's got a whole theater around it. They roast coffees for both their local stores as well as that individual store. They've got a pastry maker. They've got, uh, a sandwich, fresh sandwiches, but they've got this sole idea that the store is where it all happens. That if you want some of their selected coffees, for example, you're only going to get them if you go to the roastery. That they're going to serve them entirely different way. That there's going to be a whole different way that they train it. And um, it's easy to look at the big boys and say, well, we could never do it. What I say is what they're responding to is the customer is changing. Yes, the customer is always on. 
Yes, the customer wants to buy what they want, when they want, where they want it. But they're also looking for the experience of connection. And that connection is with a brand, it's with a server, it's with an associate much more and certainly uh, prior to them ever deciding to have a relationship with the brands that you carry. So you you mentioned location earlier. I want to go back to that. Uh, Obviously, retail is changing. Whether you want to say it's getting better or it's getting worse, it's changing. And and I, I think a lot of it has to do with a with a demographic shift uh, in America as well. Um, I'm an urban animal. I like to live in the city. I like to be able to walk, ride bikes to things, things like that. Uh, and I think that there's a big shift in thinking, especially the generation younger than, than I am, about, about wanting to live kind of in the mix. People are putting off getting married, having kids, moving to the suburbs, getting the, getting the dog and the two cars and, and, and all of that. They are, but they're still doing it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Kind of, just later. Yeah, like exactly. Millennials are, are the number one homeowners now. Definitely. We just – conventional wisdom says no. You know, uh, this. yes, you know, baby boomers, we are aging out of a lot of purchases. We're starting to look at retirement and saying, you know, I probably don't need this. We're trying to downsize out of big houses. That certainly is giving us a glut of things uh, for consignment stores and thrift stores. The value of things that my mother would have thought were great, china and furniture and a lot of heirlooms just don't have that for millennials and um, centennials these days. You know, they like to say that those generations really want experiences, you know, travel and food. It's the first generations that grew up on a, watching food shows. So, They appreciate all of that. But, uh, you know, what's great about retail is that the smart ones are figuring it out and they're really doing it again, whether it's Lululemon or it's a container store or some of the smaller boutiques. You look at what Nike's doing with their uh, stores. You look at a Ted Baker, what they're doing with each of their stores, the cool designs that they're doing. Um, There's a lot of experimentation with it. And I think the, the, the chapter hasn't been written. Who's going to, succeed and who isn't you know amazon still keeps coming out like oh we're going to be doing drone deliveries tomorrow well i don't think that's ever going to happen i don't think we're ever going to see drones going down or going through uptown charlotte uh with a package under it that either looks like it could be a bomb or really is a bomb i don't think that's reality but i think it's being foisted on us that this is where we're going well i don't think so um where are we going you know there's certainly an element of people that believe that um, we are moving away from so much consumption. You know, young people are really, it's important. There's sustainability issues, renew, recycle. So a lot of retailers are featuring those in their windows and in their stores about how they're saving the planet. Um, but there's always going to be niches. And, you know, quite simply, there's too many places to buy too much of the same thing. You know, basically, we are we are also harvesting decades of cheap money back in the 80s, where I was in Los Angeles at that time. And you know, one out at one off ramp, there would be uh, a Michaels or a Bed Bath and Beyond, a Home Depot or a Lowe's, a uh, Barnes and Noble or a uh, uh, I can't think of the other bookseller, but you get the idea. I mean, and they were on every single off ramp. Well, there never was that much um, demand for that. And that's really what so, I want to I want to focus on. I, I, I sincerely think that there is a densification going on with the way that people want to live. And I think it is going to continue to drive uh, mixed use, you know, smaller, not smaller cities because there's going to be more people, but, but I do think that there is a move towards kind of urbanism. And, Absolutely. and, I'm, and I'm curious to know what you think, how that'll change when square footage is at a premium, because the, the 40,000 square foot Barnes and Noble is already a dinosaur um, the 40,000 square foot or 50,000 square foot Old Navy heading that way. How do you see retail changing um, when when they need to fit into a more unorthodox box, a smaller box? It, it's not going to be the mall in the suburb again. It's it's going to be right around the corner, like you would see in a in a in a major yeah. city. How how do you see that affecting kind of well. macro retail? <laughs> I don't know if I have all the answers on all that, my friend. I'm quoting uh, you. This is going straight to the Wall Street Journal. You know, quite simply, you know, gaps were a certain size uh, for many years because, quite simply, they only got their jeans in a couple times a month. So they had to store all those jeans somewhere. They had to have it. Well, they don't know it. You know, 
most retailers don't need that now. They can have just-in-time delivery. So that's why we're going to smaller stores. Target, all of them, Walmart, all of them are trying to figure out smaller footprints. Millennials want to be in cities. It's that simple. That's where the events are. That's where the cool kids are. Unfortunately, that's also where rents are so expensive. So um, they're typically putting more money into shelter uh, and then, you know, eating out much more than uh, boomers and earlier generations. So I think that's there. But, uh, yeah, you know, the commercial real estate in New York right now is something like 30 percent vacant. I think it's something astronomical. And you think, my God, what is going on? Well, you know, the real estate guys don't want to lower their prices because that Hell affects no. the way that their business is, is valued. They'd rather hold it than than lower it. Uh, retailers are saying, I don't need a flagship anymore because it's very expensive to to do. And uh, they don't necessarily the draw that they used to be. So I think you're going to have to see the real estate uh, are going to have to come together with the retailers because quite simply the retailers don't need the real estate as much as the real estate needs the retailers anymore. And, um, you know, there's only so many cell phone stores we can put in a, a block. So what are you going to do? You've got to find that mix. And the other thing is I think the smart real estate guys do realize that mixed use, however you, you constitute it, it, has to be crafted like a mall, that there has to be enough – Restaurants of a variety. The merchandising of, mix has to be dead on, whether it has it's 10,000 square feet or a million square feet. No yeah, question. I mean, you know, we're not going to see another, oh, we'll open a Tiffany's and a little Barney's and we'll put a Nordstrom and then we'll put, you know, all these high-end restaurants around it. That's probably just not going to work. And the same way we're going to build a, like an Old Navy and we'll have a, you know, um, It's probably not going to be as formulaic that, as it was in the past. Yeah, because that's what makes it dynamic, that you're able to explore and find something new. So I think it's a great time for real estate. I think it's a great time for retailers, but it's, um, it's also a time to, to not only experiment, but just to be brilliant on the basics. You know, that's why people come to me. If your listeners want to find out where you can go to retaildoc.com, uh, you could find out that there's a reason why, um, I'm as successful as I am is because what hasn't changed is consumers still want to feel something when they go in that yes, there's a percentage that always will be online and don't care, and that's fine. But ultimately, how you craft those four walls is going to determine your success, not what the Amazon's doing or what Walmart's doing. It's what that's, you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, well, Bob, you've been extremely, extremely generous with your time. Um, and, and tell people, I, I want to I hit you with two kind of lightning round quick questions before I let you go. But before I do that, please tell people how can they connect with you? How can they learn more about what you have to say and about, about what you have to give to the world? Give them, give them a couple quick places to find you. <laughs> Wait, well, you should certainly go to retaildoc.com. That's R E T A I L D O C.com. And I've got a blog there. You can find out about my motivational speaking, my sales training and my online training, uh, salesrx.com. You could certainly check me out on Facebook, the retail doctor got about 15,000 people there. I do live videos once a week or so. I got about 15,000 on Twitter as the retail doctor. And I think I'm almost up to 400,000 followers on LinkedIn. So you can find me out there. That's where I was named the top voice for retail in 2018. Uh, so two, two quick closer questions. Then I'm going to, I'm going to leave it, leave everybody with a quote. Uh, but these are, this is quick. This is right off the cuff. Why in the world, in the face of the retail apocalypse and closings and, and everything like that, why, does the research say that Gen Z's care about brick and mortar more than, than their older counterparts when everything else is saying that online is the only thing that matters? How, well, I how think do those two things sync up? A, I think it's authentic. I think B, they grew up on the net. They've ordered online. They, they know that that's just not as much of a joy as finding something. Again, you got to make the distinction. We go online to buy something. We go in a store to discover something. This is a generation that's smart. It's curious, it wants authentic, it wants different, and it likes physical uh, location. And that's, you know, again, I didn't answer the survey. That's what they told us out of 12,000 responses and 1,200 responses and um, 400 retailers trying to answer that. So, Okay, the second question. So I, I'm a big restaurant guy, and I know a lot about the business. When I am sitting there and my waiter, waitress, brings me my drink and they're holding the top of the glass where I'm about to drink and put my mouth. 
I cringe. I, I physically, it, it gives me a reaction. Yeah. I want to know in your retail brain, what is cringe worthy to you when you walk into a store? Oh my God. Don't get me started. It's gotta be quick. Uh, I walk in and you're on your cell phone. I walk in and I see nobody. I walk in and you say something stupid to me, like, how you doing today without looking at me? I walk out of your damn store and to my back, you say, did you find everything okay? When you've never said a word to me. I go into a fitting room and it's full of clothes that no one got off their butt and went and fixed. I go and I look at half of your lights are burned out or I look at somebody's got a taped on sign on a POS system that's done with an iPad does not work or I've got mannequins that are set poorly or I've got nothing but sale sign after sale signs or have you put a stupid table right in the front and the six feet in that this is blocks what's called way. touching a nerve audience that, that's what well, that's dude, what that's I'm called. the retail doc I'm just saying you're asking me like what are the top cancers in retail like well there you go all right one last one Digitally native versus legacy companies. Um, obviously, the digitally native, vertically integrated brands. I mean, these guys have a speedboat kind of mentality to the way they're yeah. be able to sh- shuffle and pivot versus a legacy brand. How can an older, more established brand compete with these young guys and their and their kind of nimble ability? Well, let's also, you know, let's just understand a few things. I mean, the nimble guys have a very narrow niche. They're not trying to go after a very That's wide, right. you know, Warby Parker is going, people you like cheap glasses, you're going to go to Warby Parker. If you don't like that, if you don't like that kind of frame, you're probably not going to go to Warby Parker, right? So um, I, I think that the one thing that digital natives have that is uber brilliant is they've sold all this product, whether it's Casper or whoever it's going to be. And they know the zip codes that tend to resonate with them. So that gives them a really good idea of what sells, what model sells, what color sizes, and they're able to then build their store around it, which is pretty amazing. Um, the downside of that is that, uh, they don't know what they don't know. So just because they haven't sold something in, I don't know, Des Moines or something doesn't mean there's not a, a market for it. And I think the legacy brands have to really um, mine the data. You know, we hear it's all about the data, but Every something smart I was person reading, I talked to on the show, that's, that's something they harp on data. data yeah. Data. It's, I want to say it's like, I, I think 85% of retail data is dark data, which means we have it. We don't know how to access it or correlate it. I was talking to the VP of Frito-Lay one day, and she said, you know, with our data, we know that people that buy pineapples also are most likely to buy a calling card and a toothpaste, a toothbrush. And she goes, so tell me, are we supposed to put a toothbrush display and a calling card in the pineapple section? She goes, that's the problem, that most data is anecdotal. It's interesting. But what do I do with it? So that's why so many companies are rushing, whether it's uh, Oracle or IBM or you know Salesforce, whoever they are, arms trying to figure out, yeah, how do how do I unlock that? Whereas the digital natives started off without that, right. but they don't have near the depth. I mean, imagine if Sears could have found all that data, they would have been That'd Amazon. Be yeah, absolutely. All right, Bob. So- I want to I want to just take a moment and acknowledge you for being on the show and taking 45 minutes out of your extremely busy schedule to share, you know, decades of of knowledge and experience with with my listeners. And I want to leave on this quote uh, that that I believe is yours: "Promises are worthless unless you have an actionable, detailed, branded customer experience that starts from the moment someone calls or walks in the door." until the time you hang up or they leave the store. I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of wisdom and, and a lot that retailers can learn uh, from that one quote. Uh, Who said I, that? That guy was brilliant. <laughs> that guy was brilliant. Oh, wait. <laughs> that guy needs a raise. Uh, so anyway, I just want to take that and, and leave everybody with that and, and take a moment to say thank you for being on the show. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Great talking to you as always. Thank you.